There's no such thing as a change too small. We create community. We create safe space. We create trust. We are home and we want to bring many other people home. There was a problem that needed to be fixed and the YMCA was part of that solution. We can all make a change. First, we need to transform our lives and then we'll be able to transform other people's lives. You have to keep trying to build that bridge and keep trying to have that conversation. Well, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. It's great to be here today. My name is Kim Miller. I am from the United States. I work for an NGO that is focused on racial equity and social justice. I'm very excited for our discussion today on civic engagement with, of course, a focus on the youth lens. Really, how can we empower youth to be those change agents, which all of you have proven that you are. Um, this has been a fabulous, fabulous concert conference. I know this is our last, last day already. Um, so let's end on a note that is very practical, uh, will help people to learn, um, so I'm excited to do so. A couple of notes before we get started is that we'll have a discussion here on stage, but um, shortly into the discussion we'll offer an opportunity for you to ask questions. So we do have a mic in the middle, but you can use the app as well. So please, as we're having this discussion today, think about how you may want to ask a question to one of the panelists or all of the panelists, because um, we want you to participate. So let's go ahead and get started, getting to know our panelists today. Um, many of you may have recently seen him in our opening sessions. We have two individuals from that standpoint. John Loughton here. Uh, John is based in the UK, where he is the founder and CEO of the global leadership company Dare to Lead. Sitting next to John is Zoe Kelland, who's also based in London, uh, the digital campaign director at Global Citizen, uh, which is an organization focused on ending extreme poverty. Uh, next to Zoe is Alicia Knudsen, who is of the YMCA in Norway um, and very passionate in the area of um, mental health. We also have Laís Leo, uh, who is the founder and executive director of In Cities in Brazil, um, an organization dedicated to safer and more inclusive cities for women um, in Latin America. And then finally, also we have Kumi Naidu, who is the Secretary General of Amnesty International and just has had um, an amazing career from even very young to really be a leader in the area of social justice um, and environmental um, campaigns. Um, he's from South Africa. Um, so let's give our panelists a warm welcome. <laughs> Before we really dig into the conversation, I think it would be helpful for our audience to know a bit more about you, but I'd love to share, uh, ask each person to share a bit about how old were you first started to become civically engaged, driving change in your community, and what was it that you did? Because I think one of the things that being here for the last few days is that age does not matter. You can be an activist at any point in your life. Um, so I, I would love to begin there. Um, John, if you wouldn't mind starting, and, and we'll kind of talk a bit about what you did to first get started as a young person. Sure, uh, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I guess my story and my journey is I started my first like small, very local campaign or like movement when I was 11. Um, uh, and then it got more political as I got a bit older and I started to learn about how to articulate my own disadvantage or my own problems and my own struggles. But it started off like I was passionate to get young people 
involved with like, supporting pensioners. Super simple, serving them like crusty biscuits and warm juice and cordial, and just create a conversation. So I think one of the, the risks I've learned through being a, a young activist, and uh, we like to see ourselves as disruptors, but we risk becoming part of just an alternative profession in itself, being a professional activist almost, is that it's easy to get angry at the older generation and say young people first at the expense of everyone else, but intergenerational collaboration is really important, intergenerational solidarity. So even then I was really passionate to get the, like, the stereotyped, like, judge young people who were maybe in gangs or in hoodies connecting with, with pensioners and, and, and working together. And as I got older and went on and got, pro actually as I got more angry, I, I was like, why do I go to a school that you're more likely to go to prison than university? Like literally, why, um, why do we live in like a decaying house? Why uh, are we judged by other people in society? Why is my postcode going to prevent, or my zip code going to prevent me from getting a job? Um, and I guess somehow I just, started to get angry and we would start off like throwing eggs at local politicians windows and like we're trying to get arrested from the police and it, all my I suppose the struggles would come out in a negative way but deep down there was a passion to change the world or change my world or our worlds in the streets that I was on and even now I don't know if anyone else gets this but you become such an emotional supporter of the underdog like when I see injustice or disadvantage like I get really passionate to try and be a voice and, and engage with them and I had that since very young, I guess I was a fixer. And that started with my own family to try and change that. And we helped set up the first ever youth forum and for a long time. And this is a challenge to civil society, is that like, it wasn't even that long ago that there wasn't a great deal of space in civil society for young people. Even the civil societies, they had their own like celebrities and experienced people who you dare not question or argue or challenge. And you know, they had their small little entourage that followed them around. And, Eventually I got involved in things like the Scottish Youth Parliament, which was one of the, the foremost democratically elected youth platforms in the world, genuinely youth-led, and through our partnerships we helped create, create impact. And it's the first time I met Kumi, actually, was through the, through the Youth Parliament, and we set up a big international programme, even at the time Kumi was at, uh, telling you your career now, Civicus, and we realised there was a big gap for young people's voice within a civil society space. And we thought we were disruptors and open and we helped create um, a space for young people to come together. So I've never really had a grand plan. I never planned on being a professional anything, let alone not being a speaker and a trainer and finding a voice to go and make noise. But it started off like youth work programmes, employability programmes, very local in, in my community, which was an area of high urbanised poverty, I guess. And I tried to wear the posh suits and have the nice haircuts and use the big words. I, the suit didn't fit me. <laughs> uh, the words were ill-placed, so, but I was passionate. And I guess as I've gotten older, I've got less angry, because if you get angry, people sometimes stop listening. But you have to get smarter and get around the table and be a partner. However, I've went full circle, and now I'm getting annoyed that not enough people are angry. Like, I'm sorry, the opposite of passionate sh is not professional. You can be passionately professional, and even now we go to meetings, and has anyone ever been asked, like, or you've said a sentence, I'm here today wearing a, this hat, or I've got a couple of hats on today. And I'm like, I don't care what hat you've got on, you've got the same head underneath it, like, I want to get an authentic slice of you. So, like, my whole thing is about, like, own your authenticity and speak out. I still get it wrong, I speak too long, I ramble, uh, I get too passionate, I get w whatever, but, um, yeah, it's, it was just like a guy who got captured by turning disadvantage or struggle. People will make it define you unless you find your own voice to own it. And then it stopped defining me and started to refine me. And now I own it. Um, but the baby steps are in organizing to the youth club, every interaction being an opportunity. Like, you don't know who you could speak to and just see, like, keep your mind fertile. Like, what can you sprout? What can you plant and grow? Like, people are like, oh, but where do I start? I, I don't have an opportunity to take. Then you're like, well, neither did I, but make one. Like, fabricate it, create it, be impatient. Send that tweet, go and speak to that person, start that organization. And, and I'll finish by saying just, when I got starting at 11, like, people wait for perfect, and it's not going to come. Get going with good, or in some cases, average, right? Um, and you'll find, you'll find your way to like get that going and get your meetings going and get the campaign, the campaign moving. But like, if you've got a purpose, then the, the, I find the rest of it starts to, to work itself out a little bit. 
Well, thank you. And I know you said you really started with like, well, what's going on around me and asking why, which I think is great for us to do at any age. Why is it this way? Does it have to be? No. <laughs> Zoe, how about you? Hi, everyone. Um, great to be here today. Um, so I guess for me, a really pivotal moment was um, when I was 18 years old, I traveled to Kenya um, and spent six months living there in a community um, in a city called Nakuru, um, assisting in a local primary school, a government primary school, um, teaching English. Um, and I should caveat this with, um, there are, I could do an entirely different talk on the pros and cons of international volunteer programs and the white saviorism that comes with that. So if you're considering that as an option, I would encourage you to do a lot of research before doing it. Um, but this was how I really got um, passionate about what I do now. Um, essentially, I, I was assisting um, teaching a class of around 60 children. I was assisting this teacher called Miriam who taught them English and a variety of other subjects. Um, and I, I saw on a day-to-day -day basis the struggles that Miriam went through and the struggles that these kids went through just trying to get a quality education. Um, I mean, yeah, 60 kids in one class, that wasn't even the, the largest class in the school, it went up to about 80. Um, half the classes were unsafe, they were too small, um, they were made of mud, they would kind of, the roof would start to fly off if it got too, too windy or too wet. Um, so education was disrupted all of the time and a huge proportion of the kids were coming to school hungry, so, or not coming to school at all because, um, you know, they were out trying to find other means to, to get their food um, and to survive. Um, and so for me, coming from a very privileged background relatively, um, that was just a, an enormous shock. And I, I was kind of meeting and becoming very close to a group of kids who, you know, every, every break time they would take my hand and say, teacher, come out and play. And they would teach me their playground games and they would walk home from school with me. Um, and I'd be, you know, helping as much as I could. Um, but kind of meeting kids who I could see parts of how I was, as, uh, like not that long ago, these were 11 year old kids, I was 18, I could see parts of how I was when I was their age in them, seeing them and thinking, well, you know, you're so much better as a human being than I am, than I was at that age, and yet you have a fraction of the opportunities that I do, um, given the background that I'm from, that made me angry, I guess, um, <laughs> and made me want to do something to change that. Um, and so from there, at the time, the school was um, really hustling to try and raise money for an additional classroom. They were in a position where um, basically the, it was a fairly new school. It had been started by this amazing group of local teachers who um, had basically seen they needed more facilities for their kids, and they'd literally built these mud structures from their bare hands in order for their kids to get an education. Um, but they were at the point where they were either going to have to... Um, have their oldest class go to a new school to do their final exams or not take in a new group of kids the following year because they just didn't have enough classrooms. Um, so me and um, a few other volunteers at the time thought, well, you know, like these teachers know exactly what needs to happen. They've gone to everyone, they've gone to local government, they've gone to NGOs, they've, they've, they've tried, they've, the parents had built half a classroom but not managed to get any further than that. Um, and we thought, well, if there's anything that we have more access to than, than they do, it's probably money through our network of people. And, um, a classroom cost around £3,000 at the time and there were three of us so we were like well may maybe that's doable um, and so we did a sponsored bike ride um, we rode 100 kilometers across Kenya um, in a day which was <laughs> hot um, <laughs> and just thinking well we may as well try and see how far we get see what we can add on to what the parents had already done to, to try and help out and essentially it kind of grew from there and unbelievably so and um, we raised enough money for that classroom and, and then went on to start a whole bunch of other programs in partnerships with the teachers at that school um, and yeah now 10 years later we've helped over 2,000 children raised £380,000 um, to support that community and in my, in my day job what I do now is I work for a global citizen and advocacy organisation working to end extreme poverty by 2030 and one of the big issues that we campaign on is education, um, getting governments to really step up to their commitment to make sure that by 2030 every child in the world, regardless of your background, regardless of whether you're a girl or a boy, whether you're displaced, um, whether you have a disability or, or special learning needs, you are able to access that quality education that is your human right um, and ultimately end poverty by 2030. And, um, I guess that kind of passion from that very first trip and the relationships that I built there um, still carries me through today um, and makes me increasingly frustrated when I can see governments not stepping up to do the things that, um, that are so simple. It's really easy to give a kid a free school meal at, at yeah, a free school meal and suddenly, you know, they're able to learn, they're able to pay attention in class, they want to come to school because there's food from there and that's not rocket science, it's 
very simple and yet a lot of governments aren't kind of stepping up and um, doing these very simple interventions that can really make a big difference in kids lives and so yeah that initial experience and now those those friendships now with the kids that were once 11 are now 20 21 year old young adults out there um, fighting to make their community a better place those relationships is what still continues to drive what I do today yeah I appreciate you sharing that sometimes we have to get out of our own communities right that like sparks that fire in us so thank you uh, Alicia. Hi, um, I'm Alicia. I, I think, it, or for me, it's a bit tricky to answer because I, I think I've always been a kind of engaged person ever since I was very, very young. Like, like even when I was five or six, I loved to take people around to show them the areas of where Viking used to live and tell, tell all the history and why we need to learn more and know more about these things. Uh, and as a child, I, or as like eight, nine year old, I was in the Children's City Council and later on in the Youth City Council. But at that time, I was fighting for more for things like, we need a new water slide here, or we need a drinking fountain. Um, and I mean, it was very fun and interesting, but uh, growing older, I was also learning about more other things that uh, I would consider more pressing than a new water slide. Um, so, especially after getting introduced to the to the YMCA and becoming a part of that, I was learning much more about things that I'd only been like hearing a little about here, here and there without really knowing so much more about it. So, the first thing that really was like lighting a big fire in me and wanting to be like, I need to change it. Is we need to work on this. Is when I was introduced to, to learn about the human rights violations and the, the injustice against Palestinians. As I have a family in Israel, and I've been hearing about like what uh, what's been happening to them, and that their like neighbor house was bombed. Sometimes it was many things. So I was just like, oh, this is complicated. I don't know so much. But after learning about it, I was like, oh, whoa, we really need to do something about this and it will be better for everyone. Uh, so that's how my like international uh, engagement started and from there on I've just been longing for more information about what's going on everywhere and trying to figure out what can we as individuals do to try our best to, to make it better for everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I when you shared about you know eight or nine years old starting in this youth council in your community, I definitely, once we get through this piece, want to talk about government and how young people can get involved in government, um, that you're not too young to do so. So, how about you? Well, um, I work with uh, urban gender violence, um, uh, violence on urban spaces against women in Brazil and in Latin America. And as Alicia said, I. I used to be a very active children, and I really wanted to attend different, address different things and, and help people around. But then I really wanted to find some kind of purpose like on what I was doing, like some, uh, some line to follow. And then um, I was an undergrad student, and um, I was majoring on urban planning. And then I realized that I would have to, to do a final project thesis and that we are like obligated in Brazil. And then I, re I was thinking, well, what will I research? What will I have to do? So uh, maybe the, acad the academia uh, ended me, ended helping me very much because I realized that all my, my girlfriends, they were very afraid to walk to university, even though if they near, they live very nearby, like 15 minutes walking. They wouldn't go to, to university by foot or by bike. They would always take the public transportation or take a car or take a ride. Uh, and that, that di didn't happen with, happen with my male friends. They were always so independent. They didn't, ha then they didn't have to spend money on public transportation or having their own cars because they could go to university walking. And then I was realized, okay, we have a problem here. Um, that's not a coincidence. So uh, I realized that I would have to study a little bit more about uh, urban violence, which is a very subtle violence. It's not uh, very obvious, but it's something that is like kind of abstract. It's always in your mind. It's like, okay, I can't be, I can't be harassed and I can't be raped at any time. And then uh, I realized that was a, a major urban problem and it was a major urban planning prob problem. 
And then uh, I realized I would have to study that. That was the moment that I felt like, okay, I was 21. And I was like, okay, I have to do that. And um, then I started to research things because I was, okay, that's a problem, obvious problem. But I, someone must, must have studied before. But then I was, okay, nobody did. And then I had no data. I had to, to work on my final project. And I had no information. And I was like, okay, so then I will have to collect my own information and and then I okay I have three months to do that and then I started to to run things out and then in when I saw it in 15 days I had interviewed more than 500 people wow. and 500 yeah, between men and women and um, then in the end the conclusion was that yeah women are really afraid to walk on their streets in Brazil and um, were really afraid to occupy their their spaces in town, and they were really being held home uh, without they wanting that they wanted to go out they wanted to take space on squ on squares streets and parks, but they are not allowed to that so um, then I realized that I would have to do more. And I was selected for a huge event here in Europe last year. And when I came back, I was, I, I was with that feeling that, okay, we are young people, but we have power, we can do more stuff. And then I was 20, 24 this year, and then uh, I realized I would have to do more. So that's why I found it in Cities, which is a network for inclusive cities that um, we aim to support and articulate initiatives and people who are willing to make a difference for cities or who are already making a difference uh, for women in uh, their relationship with urban environments. So we basically do everything from research through advocacy. And uh, that's not something that came out of nowhere in my head. It was like a construction. And uh, it's something that I always say to people like, you have to find your purpose. You have to find everything uh, you're really passionate about. Uh, for me, it was this relation between uh, gender violence and urban violence and how I could uh, work with them together and, and how this could change uh, the lives of many women who really cannot go out of their houses in Brazil and in Latin America, which is a very uh, sexist context and um, how we could uh, work with private sector, with NGOs, with people, with public sector as well, governors as well. So we can address this in like multiple uh, initiatives and multiple, with multiple ideas and multiple approaches. So yeah, it was, I was very, very young when it started, but every year that passes by it changes a little bit in my head as well. Mm -hmm. And things are improving in slowly steps, but it's going fine. Yes, the progress. Well, yeah. thank you. And Kumi, tell us, I know you started quite young at a very challenging time and love to hear a bit more about your story, why you were considering even taking risks at that age. Thank you. Uh, firstly, I would say that it wasn't exceptional, mm -hmm. that many, many young people were standing up in very large numbers. And the trigger was a national student high school student boycott. Mm -hmm. Actually, the first slogan that started off in Cape Town, I'm from Durban, the, when the slogan started, the first slogan was, you pay our teachers peanuts, that's why they give us monkey education. Yeah. Uh, because, because basically there was a racial discrimination based on what teachers got paid and what was spent on children based on, on racial background. And to be honest, it was quite exciting at the age of 15 to go out, all the students mm -hmm. onto the streets and, and you know, we were not that sophisticated about exactly all the complexities of the political system, but what we knew was the education system was bad. Mm -hmm. um, even though, to be honest, many of our teachers were excellent. You know, many of our teachers really sacrificed a lot and and, and, I, and, and I'm sure many of you here would say, if you have been successful in your lives and you must have been to be at a venue, uh, meeting like this, somewhere along the line, there was some teacher or some teachers that had a big uh, impact. So then once we got involved, then I got expelled from school. Mm -hmm. And 
And I have to say getting expelled from school was probably one of the best things that happened because what it, it did two things. One is from an educational point of view, it actually forced you to become an independent, independent critical thinker and learner because the education system was, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with a Brazilian educator called Paulo Freire. Yeah, so Paulo Freire wrote a book called, and, and those of you interested in education, you should really find this book. It's called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And, you know, the way he critiques what he calls the banking system of education, you know, where a child or a learner is just seen as an empty mind and you just have to bank information. And, in fact, your exam paper is like a That's withdrawal right. slip to, to get what they, was banked in your head. And... Um, so I had to learn myself, uh, study from textbooks, a few progressive teachers who were willing to take the risk of being attacked by the government or losing their jobs would quietly come and teach the few of us that had been expelled from school and so on um, in the evenings. Uh, but the other reason was it kind of also being exposed. I always my brother and I, my brother is a year younger than me and we both were activists together and we, we talk sometimes and say, what if we didn't get expelled from school? Maybe we'd have just gone and become doctors or lawyers. I mean, nothing wrong with becoming a doctor or lawyer, but, but like, you know, that's how, when you grow up in a working class town, uh, township in South Africa at that time, there were three things that your parents dreamed that you would be. In order of priority, doctor, lawyer, teacher. Those are the only three sort of middle class things that were open, right? And I think governments miscalculate quite often. Mm -hmm. They think by using repression, they intimidate people from being activists. So I sometimes think that when that minister expelled us from school, he actually facilitated our involvement in struggle against the system because suddenly, in, in fact, when I was 15, I was expelled, and it was like quite traumatic, right? For me, I, I, at a personal level, my, my mom had just committed suicide a few months earlier, and it was a very scary time and a very emotionally painful time. And we always say, well, maybe we'd have, we could have easily, like, sort of, because I grew up in an area which was heavy gang violence, lots of drug uh, problems, and so on, and we could have easily you know, gone in that direction. But the fact that we had this sense of purpose, as John eloquently and some of the speakers this morning all... You, 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 I was so struck this morning, by the way, about how many used, people use the word purpose. Because, you know, just getting a sense of purpose that our lives meant something because we were taking on the apartheid state. And I must say, none of us believed we would win. Mm -hmm. Like, I never thought I would see Nelson Mandela come out of prison. Most of us never thought Mandela would come out of prison alive, right? You know, for right. most of our activism, right? And so, uh, once I got involved, then I became a community organizer. We, um, the bunch of us who were expelled from school set up a youth movement called Helping Ends. And, John, it was exactly the same path that you followed, I followed. We started off with very local things, like the two big projects. The first activism we did was um, supporting a home for the disabled, uh, older people, as well as a younger dis uh, disability home. And then I eventually, at the age of, in fact, if, uh, you know, people ask me sometimes, like, what are you most proud of? Mm -hmm. uh, or what did you do that was most amazing? I say those between 94 and 95, when I was 19 and 20, I was a living in a house father in a children's home. And I tell you, in those 10 years, uh, sorry, in those two years, I grew at least 10 years. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I learned about tolerance. My, you know, like my crap threshold level went up quite high. Uh, one of the boys, you know, all the boys, they were teenagers, they were having problems and so on. And the second thing, by the way, that I'm most proud of, and people say, like, what are the... Mm -hmm. I taught my younger sister to cook. 
uh, you know, like from my context. <laughs> so, so the, and why I was able to do that is because when I went to the children's home, I couldn't cook, I couldn't fry an egg. I was 19 then. And the boys in the children's home who had lived in the children's home for a better part of their lives had all learned these skills. And I'll just end with telling the story of one of the boys in the children's home. Uh, it was called the Lake Haven Youth Center, and his name was Jude Francis. And when the cops were looking for me, they would come and raid the children's home periodically. And once they raided the home when I wasn't there, and Jude Francis was the oldest boy, and he basically like said to them, listen, this is, a, this is a welfare institution, this is a children's home, you're not supposed to do this, and they were abusive towards him. And he is like somebody who's like, you know, you know when you have these super cool, calm and collected people? Mm -hmm. When those people lose it, you want to be far away <laughs> from them. That, that can be very right? quite scary, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he just flipped and the special branch police had to leave and go get the army to come back to arrest him because he just attacked them and they were like terrified of him. <laughs> and the two agents had to go, they came back with the army, they put him in prison for about a week. When he came back, he said, I want to become... Fully, he was he was actually more or less my age, and just to say that he got involved as actively as I was. He ended up in the same place that Nelson Mandela was on Robben Island, even though Mandela had since been moved to another prison, and he was convicted for six years, uh, and and basically, I'll end on a positive note. He's now one of the most senior police officers in the country. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> So I want to focus the next part of our discussion now that we know a bit more about all of you is how can young people break down some of these structures? So, you know, really what, what can those in the audience do when you think about government, other agencies and such? What are some of those steps? What can people do to break down the structures? Yeah, and any, anyone would like to begin? If you'd like to begin, Camila, great. Okay, so the first thing is I think young people and progressive adults must consign to the dustbin of history this phrase, young people are the leaders of tomorrow. If young people wait for tomorrow, there is very good chance there's not going to be a tomorrow for young people to exert leadership given the realities of climate change right now. I think we have to recognize that young people have something unique to offer to public debate and public uh, and, and, and policy discussions and how we imagine the future in the sense that young people are not contaminated by the really bad experience of political life, economic life, business life that many people of my generation actually have been contaminated by. So, you know, we think certain things are normal. I mean, how can it be normal that some people have virtually nothing right? And they are expected to survive. And then others have so much, they do not know what to do with it, right? And the economic system that we have breeds desperate levels of inequality. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe those of us that have lived in that system of inequality for like four or five decades actually see it as abnormal as it should, as it is, right? Uh, let, me, let me give you an example of abnormality that's seen as normal, right? So, when we think about nuclear weapons, right, as a problem, right, we always sort of, like when North Korea is developing nuclear weapons, we get like, oh my God, North Korea is developing new, new uh, weapons, and who is the country that's trying to make sure that they're not having nuclear weapons? It's the United States. The United States is the only country in the world to have used nuclear weapons, holds nuclear weapons, is not talking about disbanding its nuclear weapons, but can still be the policeman of those countries that want to get what they have. And we think that's fine. Now, I just want to be clear, I completely oppose all nuclear weapons, including those of the United States, Britain, France, China, and Russia, right? So, so we ex gender equality. Right? So I think that young people have to be asserting that, not that we want to be included because we are, like in Africa, the majority of the population. I mean, in Africa, if you look at, actually not just Africa, but in the global south generally, 
if you look at the demographic reality, young people are in larger numbers. I think Brazil as well, no? Yeah, in larger numbers than older people. So that's one thing, right? The second thing I think young people, um, what we can do is to ensure that the organizations that are serving young people uh, need to show that they trust young people sufficiently that young people should be on their governance structures, on their boards, on their, uh, you know, in the decision making and so on. I'm just coming from Amnesty's um, global AGM, which took place in Africa in, in, in Johannesburg. And each delegation from every country was given three people to come to represent each country. And one of the conditions we, we made sure we pushed this time successfully is that the third delegate had to be somebody who was under 25, right? And I can tell you, and, and this is not just like being generous, I can tell you that without those young people there, the conversation would have been completely different, mm -hmm. completely different, yeah. right? They brought real value, perspective, challenged old ways of doing things and so on, but it does mean that those of us who are adults who have power in organizations must do more about creating enabling environments for young people, not simply to have voice, not simply to participate, but also to be in leadership and making decisions together with adults in an intergenerational context like what John spoke about. Right. Thank you. I think this is so important that you said, you know, you made a requirement. So if, if you are in a, a leader of an organization, making that a requirement, that there is somebody there that's under 25, because left up to our own devices sometimes, <laughs> we'll just say, oh, who's the most experienced? Let's send them. So I think that is, is so important. John, I know you were kind of referenced in this and being able to disrupt and, you know, break down structures. What, what are your thoughts on how our young leaders can do so? Uh, I think there's a number of ways of doing it in terms of like, so we can do the whole heart rhetoric thing and that's nice and like the biggest, best campaign in the world lives in the heart of one person sometimes, like that's fine. A moment can make a movement, but there's a really simple answer I think I say is, it follows on from Kumi, but stand for election. Like if you can't take down the system, get in it and then change it from within. Like there's that old adage around, it's better to be in the tent and disrupt than be outside throwing stones. <laughs> But, sometimes when you get inside, it's warmer. The food's better. <laughs> the Wi-Fi's stronger. The people like, <laughs> yeah, they vote for them people and like they're kind of compromised by making it about themselves. But they make a great cup of coffee. They're really nice to me. They boost my ego when I've always felt crap about myself. You start to sniff a different oxygen. It does change you, like whatever anyone says. And that's why you hear it all the time, like, I believe that all these politicians entered parliament with good intentions. And what do we then say? Oh, they're all the same. The po politicians are the problem. So it's not an age thing. It's also a stage thing and, and, and mindset. Like, I've run for parliament. I've worked in the Prime Minister's office, I crossed to the, the other side, whatever. Um, and I used to have a them and us mentality and deep down the campaigner and complainer in me still has that. But there's a responsibility on us as well that to have the audacity to speak out, sometimes we have to meet that with the responsibility to be part of the answer, not ju like, don't just point the finger, le lend the hand. How do we get involved? So I say to young people, run for local government, stand for stuff, disrupt it in terms of being part of it. We can win them at their own game sometimes. Does anyone know what percentage of the world's polit politicians are under 30? It's about 2%. Yet we make up like half the world's population. Okay, lots of them are like five-year-olds, I understand it, fine. <laughs> but still, in terms of the youth bracket, that is a disgusting a disgusting uh, gap that we don't talk about. So we speak about young people and politicians. What happens when that's the same person? What does that do to the psyche of a democratic structure? Stand as a trustee and be on boards, as was said. Um, and you don't have to be like Trump or Bernie Sanders or kind of, I don't know, like um, Benedict Budo or whoever overnight. 
Maybe you stand for municipal council. You're in your community council. Because like Article 12 of the United Nations Convention is the right to be heard. So even on that legal measurement, there's so many governments breaking the law. So another step I would take, stand for election, get involved in governments, join the political parties as much as you can stomach it if you find that tough. Um, the other thing is call on governments to enshrine some of the, 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 the international youth-focused legislation into uh, domestic law to help embody that. So Scotland uh, has just passed a law that's saying 2021 they will bring in the UNCRC as national uh, legally mandated to implement that at a Scottish level. That was a huge step for us in terms of we can use our own national laws to hold government accountable on, on, on young people's rights. I think other things we can do in terms of empowering young people and, and getting involved is if there's not an organisation there to join, make one. But also, like, be ready to join somebody else's fight. We can't all be the founders of everything. Like, sometimes the most powerful person is the first one to support someone else and be that number two person and get in behind them. Has anyone seen, there's a crazy, crazy visit, a video on YouTube of a guy or a girl, he just gets up and starts dancing on, um, on a field. Has anyone seen it? They've done it a lot better than I am, right? And uh, should we all do it? No, right. Actually, I'm going to do it, right. Can you come and dance with me? Right, so there's this crazy guy just standing dancing, right? And the crazy, careful you. And so I'm standing dancing, and then I look like just the weird dancer. But watch what happens when someone joins me. <laughs> yeah. What group do you want to be with now? And watch what happens when someone else joins in. <laughs> yeah. And then before you know it. <laughs> 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 Thank you guys, you stopped me being the crazy dancer. Right, so sometimes the best thing you can do, I'm so glad someone joined in. Um, who would have thought you would have been dancing with <laughs> the head of Amnesty International today? <laughs> um, and the guy that just looks a bit like a fat Prince Harry. Um, but like, so sometimes the best thing you can do is get behind somebody else's idea. The point I make is we all try and be the kings and queens of our own fiefdoms, we start to be compromised by making our own things successful. And sometimes the best thing to do is know when to support someone else. And um, that's where solid, solidarity and I think unity for me comes from. Um, the other thing, the lesson I learned is don't try and be an adult. Because I learned this even in the youth parliament and other organizations. Do you ever see like these professional young people just becoming really bad versions of the thing we set out to change? We start to do the speeches and be all formal and dress like them and like, I went down that road. Like insecurity made me become a mirror image of all the boring, old, usually straight white men that I didn't like in the first place. Um, so that, like, That's that, why you wear a lemon shirt. Sorry? That's why you wear a yeah, lemon like, shirt. Yeah, like, come on, between here, I'm a terrible example. Like, it's not good for somebody who has like, a condition with, like, bold patterns or something. But um, the other thing, get famous. Like, it sounds dumb, right? But people listen to people with not notoriety. Get as many people as you can who have a profile involved. So one of the big problems I had was like, we can chant and chant. I marched against making poverty history. That was my generation. I grew up cutting my teeth on Tony Blair saying nice speeches with his beautiful pecs and teeth and hair as he supported like being a puppet for Bush in illegal wars around the world. Oh, but it's so fun. So what, right? He's got a great theme tune. So what, right? So we marched to make poverty history against the illegal occupation and destruction of Iraq. And I walked out at 15 from school to campaign on the streets. The next day, the headline in the newspaper was a photograph of me on a lamppost <laughs> saying truanting anarchists. That was the language. It wasn't a, yo a young generation speak out and find their voice and, you know, are becoming civically active and waking up. It was truanting anarchists. So there was all this kind of mixed messages around, actually, was it really said to young people, to, to have a voice, so sometimes you have to break the rules to, to redefine them and change it, and, and, and a bit of discomfort uh, comes in, but uh, for, for some people it's running for parliament, for others it's, it's, it's disrupting from the outside. Why don't you work together? So even like, Kumi will speak to this better, or some of um, you guys from Brazil or Norway, I don't know if you've got a really good example, of even getting like, be smart. So if I know that I'm the gobby one who calls out government and yells at them, I'll work in cahoots with you. Then you can go in with a policy paper and say, oh, this ginger guy is going crazy. I can make you look good. 
boom, let's go in. So there's ways to collaborate. Like you have to be smart with it. Like there, there's depths to understanding this. Um, and the last thing I'll say in terms of young people is a very personal one. Get a mentor. Like um, the best thing you can do is get someone who's going through a similar thing or been through that and just bounce off them. Don't be too proud for advice and wisdom. Like it's so good to like, Kumi said, don't give your life for what you do, give the rest of your life. Um, and I think lots of us here, does anyone here suffer burnout? Please, please don't, because like both words are bad, like burning and out, neither of them sound particularly good. <laughs> like, um, just make sure you're being smart with your time and your energy and, and yourself. Uh, I watch great people be silenced because of their own overstretching uh, as well. That's an absolute. So there's just some of the more practical things. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I want to make sure. And we're going to open up for questions in about 10 minutes. So get ready to ask questions. Or if you want to already send them via the app, please do so. Um, Lais, I know we talked a bit, you know, even preparing about breaking down structures and the challenges with government and such. How have you done that a bit um, in your last few years of this type of work? <laughs> well, um all over the world, we've been facing some extremist times uh, when it comes to governors and when it comes to electing uh, some people that are not necessarily representative of our countries. I believe Brazil is a great example of that. Um, we've just had elections last year, and in my opinion, we, we've made a terrible choice. And um, but when you, when you go see the statistics, you, you see that most of the young people didn't vote for our president. So we're basically already doing our part. We, we didn't vote for, for, for Bolsonaro. I'll say his name because he's our president, whatever. And um, he is a, a classic example of a n not nice guy. He's, he represents like racism, extremism, uh, uh, all kinds of xenophobia or uh, sexism. And that's not what a young people want for a country. And uh, I know that what I can say that we young people are, uh, are different from our other generations is that we are very, very stubborn. And that's something that uh, we've been talking to. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's maybe not the best word. Maybe we can uh, use uh, resilient or something like that. But I really like the word stubborn because uh, I, when I put something in my head and I say that I know that's the right thing to do, I will do that until my energy is completely dry. And uh, I think we have to be, as young people, we have to be and we have the right to be very stubborn and to be and to bring something something different and uh, different and try to be create creative out of our adversities. When we see some kind of governor uh, like that, that's the moment that we have to put our feet on the ground and have to talk directly to people and don't wait for our government to do something. We have to go there and we have to talk to people and we have to convince people face to face that that's, that's not the idea. And um, um, I'm sitting like that. I'm not like crossing my legs or I'm not trying to be fancy. Or I'm, try I'm sitting like that because that's not how usually women sit. We are taught to sit like that. We're taught to be elegant. We're taught to be posh. <laughs> and I'm sitting like that, uh, like really, really to, to show something and to show that we can be different. And I learned that from a former president of Brazil who is to be the only woman president that we had. And I, I learned that because um, we, we don't have to be doing what we are taught to do every time. We can just sit the way we feel we're comfortable. We just can be creative. We don't have to follow some norms just because someone said that. Because if we do, sometimes we just be replicating some things that were not nice. So why? Why do we have to do that? Why can't we be powerful with the things, with the tools that we have in our hands? So that's the moment that we have to be, uh, we face our challenges. We have to face those kind of people who think that just because of your skin color of, or of because of your gender of, or because of your religion, you, you must be less than, than anybody else, you're not. That's the moment you have to show that up and then you have to show that you have your power in your hands to change things. So 
um, yeah, what I can say right now in terms of government and public governments and how to, to face it is really that we have to be creative. We had to put our feet in the ground and we have um, to create new, new forms of making a difference and don't just cross our legs and just <laughs> to sit the way we want to and the way we f think it's best. All right, I, I like that of being, like I said, stubborn, but being very convicted. It's awesome. <laughs> Elisa, I, I know when we talked about, you know, working in mental health and then your time in Kenya, again, you have to break down structures because people don't even want to talk about it. In, in what ways have you, you know, used your, your voice, your passion to break down structures too? I think that our... In Norway, the last few years, there has been huge changes when it comes to how we can talk about mental health. And just like two, two years ago, it was completely different from how it is today. Two years is a very, very, very short time. Uh, so, so because of that, I was also thinking that like now I'm very comfortable to talk about it. It's, it's fine. Uh, I'm feeling confident and, it, and it, it's okay. So I'm thinking that it's... It's good for me to do it, and maybe that also will encourage others to do it. Uh, but I, I also, I just really want to uh, to comment on our... Uh, I, I'm really agreeing with everything that's already been said. And I think that one thing that was... Uh, that that you're talking about how, like, it should be intergenerational and the youth are here and now, I I completely agree. And I think that all of us should should think about that and listen to it and take it as a challenge. Um, probably some of you who are here and also me was in at the World Council last year in Chiang Mai. And yeah, I'm very lucky. I'm from Norway and they wanted the youngest people to be our voting delegate. So I was a voting delegate. In the room when we were voting, I think maybe one in 10 uh, of the people there were under 30. And we are a youth organization. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I, I've gotten the chance to travel and visit YMCA's very many different places. And I see that we have big variation in, in what's being done and how. And I think that when we want to change the world and we, we want progress, I think the best thing we can do is to start with ourselves. Uh, we have to change ourselves before we're able to also uh, influence others and change the world. Uh, so I think that's something we all can think about and take as a challenge that we, uh, we, we as youth, uh, we, come on, we're a youth organization. We, we need to be seen and heard and included most of all. Uh, so, so I hope that next year, hopefully, will be at least 50% voting delegates that are a bit younger than the average of maybe 50 or 60. Right. Uh, absolutely. We need more youth right out front and center. So what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> so I think from my perspective, I think one of the most important things in this whole discussion is understanding and believing in the power that you do have to create change. Um, I think often the reason that we don't act about the issues that we care the most about is not because we, we're not concerned about them, but it's because we don't believe that our single action is going to make a tangible difference. And that as soon as, as, soon as we see that that isn't the case, that there is someone that we can stand up with and we can impact upon the thing that we care the most about. Like I think Greta Thunberg is a fantastic example of this right now. Like it, it feels like the kind of climate movement that we're seeing at the moment that's suddenly risen in such prominence over the last few years has been a very, very long time coming. And it's not that the world was out there sitting back burning fossil fuels and thinking, oh yeah, we're fine with this, we're not concerned. I think people were concerned for a very long time, but it's the example of this 15, 16 year old schoolgirl standing up and actually having her voice heard and making a tangible difference that's caused everyone else to get up and be like, oh crap, okay, my voice can actually have an impact in this fight. And I, I think that's, that's something that we see all the time at Global Citizen. Like we, we constantly are calling on governments and big businesses to make the kind of structural and financial and legal changes that it requires to to, to end poverty by 2030, these big institutions that feel very impenetrable. Um, and we do that by encouraging our movement to, to send 
tweets to world leaders or emails or sign petitions or make calls to senators' offices in the US or all of these things that on their own it feels very small just to click a button online and, and add your name to a petition or send a tweet. Um, but actually on mass we see that that has a real impact on the way that, that politicians and leaders are, are feeling that kind of heat from the youth movement around the world and that that can, sometimes it doesn't work, obviously it doesn't work all the time, um, but sometimes it really does. Um, and I think it's repeatedly making sure that we're telling those stories of when it does create change that's so important here and continuing to kind of have that energy to, you know, sign one more petition, go to one more march, join one more thing in the hope that the next thing will make an impact and not kind of losing hope when you when you feel like, oh, well, that guy's blatantly not going to listen to me. So why would I raise my voice? Right. Especially in your role as a you know, digital campaigner, like that's key to get other people involved, even building awareness of something. I think what you shared with us earlier today, not knowing that story um, and getting people to say, you know, that they should be um, drop the charges, right? We, we need to galvanize efforts and we can do that in so many different ways, whether it's social media or using a platform like this big conference. I'm going to start pulling out the questions we've received here. Uh, there's also a mic in the middle for people that want to start queuing for questions too. But one here in particular is, how do we build bridges in an increasingly polarized world? Uh, and in particular, uh, people of different viewpoints. How do we work together to create social good? And that question could be for anyone. <laughs> yes, John. Can I tell you a, a quick personal story? Um, earlier this year, uh, April, I woke up one morning to a bunch of missed phone calls, a bunch of text messages. Um, I mean, what on earth happened? And I don't know if anyone's seen, but uh, tensions and violence re-escalated in Northern Ireland and Derry, London Derry. Um, and I realized that one of my great friends, Lyra McKee, was shot by the IRA. Mm. There was another murder, another terrorist act on British soil. And um, I lost my friend, Taufik, I mentioned before, a number of years ago in, in, when he died in uh, Libya, but to again have another young activist friend killed because of terrorism, because of ideology, because of polarized, lazy, broken, old school mentality in Northern Ireland. It was, it was so heartbreaking. Um, Lyra was the sweetest, most passive, non-violent, loving, person you could ever wish to meet, even in a room of great people, she'd be like the really sweet, lovely one. Uh, and she'd said in a talk um, before she was killed, um, if you're different from me, whether, you know, if you don't like gay people or if you, if you don't like Catholics, or she said, uh, what I want you to do is come and speak to me. Give me a hug, listen, and we'll understand. So often young people's memories lie in the future. We don't have the entrenched gripes and hatreds that perhaps gone by generations have. So I think if we want to challenge mindset of division, uh, I, I hear my friend Leader's words, who paid that with her life, by, uh, albeit a non-targeted uh, shooting, but um, she said, if we're different, come and speak to me. And that's the power of youth work. You can expose people to the other. You can expose each other to the different. Even like... Um, people where I'm from, people always go, oh my God, young people in Pilton and Muir House, they're awful and you're all criminals, but you're a good guy. What else do we say that about? Politicians, oh, they're all the bloody same, but I like that one. Exposure helps open the mind. Or they, and that's why internationalism is so important, where collaboration, cross-cultural programs are so important. I've never found a more powerful tonic than stop speaking and get out and meet and just be a minority. Um, and it always comes back to uh, when hatred stares you in the face, you have to respond with love. And that's more than just a cute statement for me. Like, it's a lesson I keep learning in my life, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you sharing that story. <laughs> Condolences as well. I know one of the things I think about too is like, us all recognizing our own biases, right? That we, we do have these even in, you know, people that are dedicated to this, what are we missing? What are some of our blind spots? But any other thoughts on, hey, how do we address this polarization and still work together? Well, if I can say something that's very unpopular to say, <laughs> building on what John just said, 
So here in Britain, right, if you meet people who work for organizations like Amnesty, Greenpeace, Oxfam, and so on, it's like taken for granted none in their families have voted for Brexit, right? Mm. If you go to the US, you know, it's like almost nobody voted for Trump, right? <laughs> but I think it's really important that we start by recognizing that the people that voted for Brexit, for Trump, for Bolsonaro and so on, if we look within our own friends and family circles, we're going to find people who voted for them, right? Hmm. We, we are saying that what Trump and Bolsonaro and Boris Johnson and all represent is demonization, where they demonize parts of the population, right, to win political favor and power. But aren't we also demonizing the people that voted for these folks if we just write them off? So I've said in a couple of public platforms the last couple of months, the starting point is we have to recognize the humanity of the people that through fear, through misinformation, through manipulation, were moved to actually vote for some of these unsavory characters. Mm -hmm. So we cannot, people who think, you know, people who say we are about human rights, about youth empowerment, we are about addressing sustainability and so on. We should not be thinking that we are holier than thou, that we are some sort of like higher breed of humanity and so on. We have to understand the humanity of the people that are different. Activism is not about going and speaking to the people who agree with you mm. and, and, and feeling good. Real activism is about going and engaging with people whose views are different. And if we believe that the values of justice, of fairness, about gender equality, about respecting indige indigenous people's rights and so on, if we believe genuinely that this is the right thing, then we must believe that we can go into the most conservative of environments mm -hmm. and be able to win people over. Not that you're going to win everybody over, mm -hmm. not will it happen overnight, but I tell you, I have gone into some places where people have criticized me for. Like, I mean, I've been going to the World Economic Forum for several years. I mean, the World Economic Forum, anybody here has had the displeasure of being there? <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it is a place where, for that week that I'm there, I really genuinely hate it. Right? But I keep the smile on my face. If I go and speak at the forums where I have to, I say exactly what I want to say. Like, I mean, once one young person in the audience said, you know, you guys who get, become heads of NGOs and heads of UN agencies and so on, once you'll get there, you'll never leave. Right? And you're a, you're a stifling space for civil society, uh, for, for young people to be able to go. And then I use the opportunity to criticize the head of the World Economic Forum who has been the founder and CEO since 1948 till present. And I said he runs the <laughs> risk of becoming the Robert Mugabe of the NGO sector. So that's a long I, time. I, and, and you know, I said it at the platform. But I have to tell you, I am convinced and I can count the people that I've moved through 15 years of participation. There are certain people who um, now call me friend, call me for counsel and advice and so on. Not, it's not to say that they agree with everything I say, but, but they're willing to engage. And the process of changing people, it's not like, to, it's not like somebody goes to bed being a racist and has some sort of dream or whatever kind of dream and wakes up in the next morning being like somebody who's completely anti-racist. It's a journey. Right? And even in South Africa, what I've learned, like I mean, in South Africa today, you can't find one white person who ever supported apartheid, right? right? Because it's, it's embarrassing to, to say that you were part of it, right? So, but people have gone through a process, painful process, and we have to recognize that if we're going to change people, it doesn't happen overnight. It requires those of us who are wanting change to be much more humbler than we are. I have to say that activism sometimes is full of arrogance, mm. it's full of holier than thouism, it's like we know, you don't know, listen to us. That has to change. Mm. Those of us, and, and, and that's, I must say, for when I went to Greenpeace, I tried to bring that same 
values to Greenpeace, and I try to do that now with Amnesty as well. Because if we are not more humble, why should people respect us when they see we are almost having the same kind of arrogance mm -hmm. of the Trumps and the Bolsonaros of the world? Right? Because it's arrogance. It's about holier than thouism. We know you follow us. We are the holders of gospel truth. And we'll never be able to bridge, build bridges if those that are trying to change with more progressive values and so on show the same kind of arrogance right. that the Trumps and Boris Johnsons of the world try to pursue. Yeah, such a great point. <laughs> Somewhat related to that, uh, a person by the name Joseph asked a question uh, that not all young people want to be activists. Not everybody wants to get involved. So what advice do you have that how we can engage those who may not be passionate, not naturally activists, right, to bring other people along? So how do you, how do you get others you know, to join you? Well, or this one I relate to uh, very much because, as I said, I've always been one of those active people and almost all of my friends, at least childhood friends, are just like, why do you care about these things even? They're not in your life. It's not your problems. Uh, but lately, more and more and more of my friends are, are becoming a bit active and are choosing like, oh no, I want to buy this instead of this because I know of the workers' conditions and oh, I want to do this. I have to sign this petition. Uh, and what I notice like in, in just my circle is that the closer it is to you, the easier it's to do something. So like when when I've been traveling and volunteering and other things, then, then people have never really been so interested in those things are just like, how can I support you? Because they know me. Uh, and that's making it so much easier when you personally uh, can relate and like uh, friends of mine who never really cared about if something is fair trade labeled or not, they, when they suddenly met someone who herself is traveling to Sri Lanka and uh, having like a group of women there who are making clothes and then she's bringing them back to Norwich is just like oh, I will buy all my clothes from there or from here like yeah when when it gets close then people also get passionate so I think that that's that's something great that we all well can do like at least th those of us who 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 have friends or contacts all over try to to talk about it and tell it and bring bring it close so it becomes a personal relationship Right, yeah. Making it personal is so important in all that we do. Absolutely. Any other thoughts, particularly those for our young leaders here? <laughs> I would like just to add that um, we can make a, hu a bigger impact in the world if everybody does small things. Like, n it's not like a little number of people who do like who are perfect, who do everything totally right uh, that will change those things. It's like if everyone do, do their just little like little steps there little something we can make a huger difference so yeah that's it basically that ba the example that one person can give to other 10 will make if they if th those 10 make little like little little steps uh, we can make a huger impact sorry can i just add one sentence to that when my younger yeah. brother was in just to support what you're saying my younger brother spent about a year in prison during the anti-apartheid period and he smuggled a letter to me once through my father. And one of the things he wrote there, uh, he said, I've come to realize that the struggle for justice is not won by the immense sacrifices of the few, but the modest sacrifices of the many. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and this, is the, this point that you just heard is probably the most important point I've heard in since I've been here, because it's saying that we have to open up different avenues and pathways to participation for different people. If somebody is a single mom with three kids, she is probably less likely to be in a position to engage in an act of civil disobedience and risk going to prison for two weeks because there's not going to be anybody to look after the three kids, right? So we need to, but she might be able to in the evenings do three hours of cyber activism, you know, by doing things. That, and we need to work out ways of valuing people's participation based on the circumstances and not judge people because they're giving too little and so on. And, and the point that John made, which is a criticism on me as well, John. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> the, the point about burnout, right? 
Because the other thing is, we also have this, uh, you know, like, oh, you know, Kumi or John or whoever is so committed, you know, is they so active, they, 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 they sacrifice so much and so on. I would argue that that probably overall is a net negative message to send. We have to send the message that all of us can participate. We can all participate in different uh, ways. I was speaking to a musician in South Africa the other day, and I was saying to him that you are much more powerful to make social change than I am, because your music can reach many, many more <laughs> people in our country than my speech will reach. So I genuinely believe that, like for example, trying to lift up people in arts and culture and so on, and get them more voice will have more impact for the kinds of messages we need to communicate right now. Yeah. Kumi, if you wouldn't mind, will you say that, uh, I will say like the, what you quoted <laughs> about um, the, from the, a modest effort. Will you say that one more time just so everybody can hear? And I, I thought that was very profound. So this is in my PhD thesis because I put it in my acknowledgements, my brother's, <laughs> right, right. My brother's words. The struggle for justice is not won by the immense sacrifices of the few, but the modest sacrifices of the many. Yes, thank you, I appreciate that. We have a, we'll go to a question here right at the uh, podium. Thank you. Um, my question is for, uh, first, my name is uh, Baba Femi Akikugwe, I'm a delegate. A little bit the... closer, please. All right. My name is Baba Femi Akikugwe. Um, I'm from, uh, I, I'm a delegate from the United States, uh, but I'm a Ni Nigerian um, as a citizen. Um, my question is for John and, and Kumi. Um, and this, this question is uh, straightforward. Um, recently, one of the leaders who tried to organize a protest um, um, to challenge the government was recently imprisoned. And kind of just sparked this question based, based off of your um, early years in activism and, and community service. Um, and the question is, fear of persecution is one of the major fear for African youth. Um, how do we demystify the consequences of standing out and standing for what you believe in, especially when, if, when it's the right thing? And to John, um, what, are your, what, are, what is your organization and similar organizations doing to help youths who want to speak out, who want to stand for what they believe in, especially in Africa, knowing fully well some of the intricacies that goes into African governments, especially uh, governments in the South and Western uh, uh, Hemisphere? I'm actually going to ask, because I had a struggle hearing the question, come on up to the front. Right. Would it be? <laughs> Good. Do it old school. <laughs> Yes, and if you, if you wouldn't mind repeating your question, and, and then I'll say it out loud to make sure everybody can hear it on the mic. But. Awesome. Um, I said fear of persecution is one of the issues that African youth have. And um, I was asking, how do we demystify the consequences of standing out, especially when you're standing up for what is right in an African center? And for you, John, um, with Dead to Lead that you have going on, what is that organization and similar organizations doing to empower youth to stand for what they believe in uh, in Southern Africa, in, in Western Africa? Because uh, recently, one of the leaders who tried to organize a protest was actually silenced by being imprisoned. So what are the things, and this, this kind of dampened morale for mm. many youths who wanted to stand out and really come out and talk about governments and, and how the impact of youth is not being heard in our country. So how do you help in, with your organization and similar uh, to help uh, youth stand out? And for you is, how do we demystify the fear of consequences when you want to stand out um, against uh, issues like this? Yeah. I'll, I'll paraphrase very, very slightly, but there is a fear of persecution. And, and you're talking about that particularly in African countries. So how do we empower uh, youth to be able to still take action when there are consequences, and, and we, we know that those exist. They're not necessarily going away tomorrow, so. Mm. I'm not going to be the white guy that tells young people in Africa how to campaign <laughs> about Africa, for Africa, in Africa. So, uh, there's, a, there's a note, like, I'll leave that to Kumi. Or, do you know what? You can answer your question better than me, bro. 
You could answer that probably better. But what I'd say, I've only been arrested one time. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, one time for activism. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, pre it's good to be honest. <laughs> Awkward, <Yes>. yeah. <laughs> but your criminal record gets wiped in Scotland at 16, so I can deny it. Um, <laughs> and it was outside a thing called Faz Lane, which is a nuclear base, because the UK thinks, let's stick our big bombs that can be nuclear active up in Scotland. Why not? Um, so we campaigned outside there and, and got arrested. Um, activism, like... Actually, I don't know if I love the word. I called myself a community activist growing up. And we were like, viva, viva, Palestina, people before profit, rip down the system, like proper angry. But as I've gotten older, like, activism can be nuanced. Like, it can be online. It can be um, invisible. It can be anonymous. You don't have to be carrying, a, like, a sarcastic slogan on the streets walking down. You don't have to be smashing up buildings. Like, um, there's a term and a... I don't read books. I've read one book in my whole life, and it was, of course, Mandela's autobiography. And the sentence that jumped out is a white ginger kid in Scotland was a phrase that said, the oppressor defines the terms of the warfare when speaking about retaliation or whatever. And that stuck in my head around like, how bad is the system that we feel we have to put ourselves and our lives at risk? Now, I'm not saying on, on that level, but um, I see amazing stuff happening in Africa and right around the world that is grassroots local local work and I think being arrested and jailed that's one sometimes you need to put your yourself on the line to get out there and you just need to do it and if you feel you want to go for that or you have to I'm going to support you it's not my job to tell you to not do it but equally sometimes pragmatism comes in and you have to play the long game there's no point getting arrested getting angry and being locked away because what can you if everyone does that, there's no one else out there keeping the momentum in a campaign going. Um, so that, that would be my message. And like, do you know what? Even now, look at the state of this world. Like, we have got like tyrant regimes running racist campaigns who have never had a democratic mandate. And that's just in the democratic countries. That's, that's the USA and Britain and, 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 and Russia. What's the promise to young people? You can't work hard and make it. Social mobility doesn't work anymore. We know that if you're born poor, you're more likely to die poor than any other time. We've not got the chance to escalate because of concentration. So maybe for some people, just joining a trade union is an act of defiance. Voting is an act of defiance. Sometimes being willing to speak out in your local youth group and challenge the homophobe is an act of defiance. Like, I understand, like, I remember going to, like, uh, where was I? I was in Kenya working, and I met all these young people, and these guys were like, yeah, we're believing human rights, and we're working together, brother. And then I said I was gay. Oh, then human rights stopped, because it can't be selective. So my message to all these people is, dream as big as you want and work hard, but remember, in my view, human rights isn't a pick and mix. You accept the fundamentals of everyone on this planet equally, or you struggle to call yourself a universal human rights champion. Uh, just with regard to the specifics for Africa, I mean, let me just say that if history teaches us anything, when humanity has faced a major injustice and so on, those things only move forward when decent men and women step up and say enough is enough, I'm prepared to put my life on the line, I'm prepared to go to prison if necessary, and so on. And what you're seeing happening in the African continent today is that the highest levels of moral courage is coming from young people. So in Sudan, where we got rid of a dictator of many years recently, it was young women who were in the forefront of that um, resistance. Uh, when you look at the campaign for university fees in South Africa, which was called Fees Must Fall campaign, um, young women again and young men as well were very, I mean, they drove the campaign. So the question here is, goes back to the point that John made, which is we need not everybody to go to get arrested. Let me ask you a question. Can anybody guess the guy that heads up Greenpeace's um, actions unit, you know, the people, the person who's responsible for sending 
like when I was there, people like me to go get arrested and <laughs> do civil disobedience. Can anybody guess how many times he's been arrested? Sorry? <laughs> yeah. Zero. <laughs> yeah, he's never been arrested once, right? But I tell you, without him, many of the actions would not happen, right? So we shouldn't, we, we just need to recognize that different people can contribute in different ways. But at the moment, uh, I had the honor and privilege between Greenpeace and Amnesty to lead the formation of a new African-wide social movement known as Africans Rising for Justice, Peace and Dignity. Uh, its manifesto is known as the Kilimanjaro Declaration, and you'll be happy to know that it's open to the African diaspora as well. So anybody with African roots anywhere in the world can join. And it's, dr it's driven by young people, right? And they are taking calculated risks. And I think that's also important because we don't want to give, we don't want to make it easy for the oppressor by not being thoughtful about how we plan and execute resistance, right? We have to be thoughtful, we have to make it difficult. I mean, you know, when I was 22 years old, just before I fled into exile, I was a master of disguise, you know, like, I mean, I once was operating with a Lionel Richie look-alike disguise, <laughs> which meant I had to go five o'clock in the morning to get a perm done at a salon in Durban, and I didn't know it was such a messy thing having a, a perm because of the smell of all the substances they put in your hair. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so, so what I'm saying is that you, there are people, unfortunately, desperation and the level of the oppression is what determines the level of risk that you're willing to take. And I think, therefore, you're going to see in the next five years a massive upsurge of civil disobedience in rich and poor countries as young people see that their futures are being sold down the toilet by adult and political uh, leaders. Uh, I, I would just say the, the point that John makes is really important. How do you get some measure of protection for young people, right? And that is about young people believing that they can contest and win political power. Now, let's be blunt. Most of our political systems are broken, right? Seriously. I mean, look at the United States. I mean, Trump won less than 25% of the vote, mm -hmm. right? Half the people in the U.S. didn't vote in that election, and three million people more voted for Hillary than voted for, for Trump, correct. right? <laughs> and, and so, you know, we need to... And, and I want to send a friendly challenge to the YMCA, in 1999, some of you might have known the Commonwealth Youth Program and a woman called Jane Foster used to head that up. You remember Jane, right? So Jane and I edited a book in 1999 for Civicus called Putting Young People at the Center. You might remember it, right? Putting Young People at the Center. And one of the things we call for in one of the chapters, by the way, this is not an Amnesty International position, I should just say, otherwise I'll get myself into trouble and I go back to the office. But this was in 1999, uh, where we called for the voting age to be reduced to 16, right? I think we need to ensure, because young people at 16, well, I mean, you know, the average age of people killed in the Vietnam War was 17, but the voting age in the United States is 18. Right? So if people are young enough to be sent to war to be killed, surely they have a right to have a voice in elections. So I would invite the YMCA to have a serious, robust conversation in the movement about whether, in fact, the voting age should be reduced to 16. Because I think right now, today, the way information is shared and so on, young people are in a position to make more informed decisions than many of the parents are. And I think that's a debate. It's a high time we need to have it. And I hope that many governments will consider reducing the voting age to 16. Thank you. All right. So I realize we are very short on time and I want an opportunity for our, our three women in the middle here to just end with some closing remarks, exactly, um, and give each of you a minute to share your advice to those in the audience, those who will watch this later on, of what they can do to, to take charge, be empowered, use their platform, um, and any advice that you just have and you know, each of us to take a minute to do so. So Zoe, let's start with you and, and work our way down. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so I think my advice for anyone really wanting to get get started campaigning or creating change around an issue that you feel passionate about would just be to 
go out and try something small. Um, educate yourself, go out and find as much out about the issue as you can. Um, be willing to listen and learn from people who have been doing it for much longer than you have, from people who are, um, who are affected by the issue more than you are. And then go and try something small and see where that takes you. Sometimes it won't work, sometimes it will. Um, but I mean, the, the programs that I was talking about in Kenya when we first set out to build that classroom, we really didn't even think that that was possible. We, we, it, was, it was such a faraway dream and I remember the head teacher of that school at the time sitting me down in what was his mud office at the time and showing me the, the kind of plans for how he envisioned the school being in, in a year, in five years, in ten years. And at the time the school was just like a row of classrooms, like one single row of them. And he showed me this drawing of kind of a whole horseshoe with like 2,000 kids learning in it and a library and a dining hall and a kitchen feeding all the kids who needed it and all of this. And I remember looking at it and thinking like this, this is never going to happen. Like it was so, so far detached from the reality of the situation at the time. And that today is how that school looks. Like I go back every year and I stand in a place where, well, I used to stand kind of at the back of the school field looking on these, where the row of the classrooms was. Um, and I used to kind of watch it grow every year as I went back and visited and, and look, and I can't do that anymore because there's a row of classrooms where I used to stand. Like it's the thing that we thought was just in our head is now reality and it's kind of entirely mind-boggling to stand there and see that having come to life. And it wasn't until we tried to do that first tiny thing that we saw that we actually had any power at all. And, and once, you, once you take that step, it's quite addictive to see like, oh, I changed something small. Like, maybe I can change something else if I just keep going. And, and that snowballs far more than, um, yeah, far more than you might expect. Um, and I think for those of us already involved in these kind of issues, I mean, I think the point around humility is a really important one because I think often we do come at this from a perspective of like, oh yeah, I know best, and, or, or it's quite intimidating for someone to come into these issues for the first time because, I mean, we've all been that person in the room, right, where your friends are having a conversation or you're in a meeting and you don't, you're not really understanding the conversation, right, and you're just kind of nodding and you're afraid to put your hand up and say like, actually, I've never heard of that dictator before, can you just like start from square one and tell me why this is bad and often I think we kind of create that environment where it's quite intimidating for people to say like I, I, I have a slightly different perspective or I just don't know anything about that please tell me and for those of us who are kind of involved already I think that's really important that we're willing to say like oh okay actually no you voted differently from me or you don't actually know anything about this like let's just have a coffee and, and chat and you can hear my perspective and I'll hear yours um thank you yeah. appreciate that thank you very much Lisa. Uh, first of all, I just really want to mention uh, regarding the, the question that was asked that uh, the African Alliance of YMCA have one program called Subject to Citizen and one about uh, or called Why Justice about injustice and these things I think they're very very much related to just what you're asking so if you have a chance find someone from the African Alliance and they can tell you much much more about it than what I can. Um, and other than that, I think that like or we're all very different, and but most of us we, we we can think about something that we really think should be changed. But some of us we really like to talk a lot. Mm -hmm. Others don't really like so much to talk in front of people. And I think that it's so important to just find what works for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, huge changes can be made in so many different ways. Like I don't know if you've heard about a, a campaign about million miss millions missing. Uh, it's about the chronic fatigue syndrome and they're putting shoes out for, for people who have the disease and they write a small note on it. So like there's not even people, there's no screaming, but it's gaining a lot of attention. And I think that like, like if you love to dance, if you lo love to paint, do whatever you love to do and you can relate it to also the injustice you're seeing and what you think this is so urgent, this needs to be changed right now. And then just do it. Maybe it will not be very good the first time, but then maybe the second time it's better. And the third time very much better again. <laughs> Sometime it will work out. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. I have one just very quick advice. That is be stubborn and stand for what you believe. That's it. <laughs> Right. I want to thank all of our panelists for, for sharing their knowledge, sharing their experiences. I hope people feel inspired and ready to do more. I think there's so many resources out there, um, whether it's for the organizations that you work with or work for, um, but other things. So let's, I think, 
one of the things I love to think about in this is like, let's stay connected <laughs> because we can help one another um, and do so successfully. So appreciate all of your time today. Enjoy the final day um, and just appreciate everything. So thank you. Just on, be, just on behalf of the uh, sort of organizing team, I want to thank Kim as well, who I thought has facilitated brilliantly today. So can we just give a thank you to Kim? Thank you. And then is it, you take one, you take one and pass one on, if that's right. Just, just a little thank you note for everybody from be, on behalf of us. Please do look in the app as well. There's a feedback seminar, a session, just to give your comments on how today went, uh, thoughts, questions, uh, reflections. We're going to gather all these up. They're also going to make it into this evening's kind of sort of presentation as we wrap up the thing. But can I ask you one last time just to give a thank you to the panel and to Kim as our facilitator.